Our first talk is Muin Curry, who's from the um, CDC, Office of Public Health Genomics. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me part of this meeting. Can you all hear me? Okay, I'm going to keep my own time here since... Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to start with the big picture, which is the public health perspective. Um, and I'd like to explore three things with you today, is exploring that intersection between implementation or implementation science in particular, genomics and precision medicine and public health. I'd like to second use cancer as a case study because that intersection has become more and more mature over time. Um, which is outside the traditional newborn screening area, which is the most mature area at the intersection. Then I'd like to end up with um, a new opportunity for collaboration uh, through the uh, National Academies for Science, Engineering, and Medicine, so-called the IOM Roundtable on Genomics and Precision Health. We have an action collaborative that hopefully uh, <clears throat> can whet your appetite. So the intersection has kind of um, been small over time. I live on the left-hand side uh, in this world of public health that's trying to secure as a society what we can do to improve uh, population health. And that world has been um, not very friendly to genomics. And I can say that without uh, too much um, misrepresentation. Um, genomics has come from the world of basic science, bench to bedside. And now that intersection with implementation Ignite is a, actually a first foray into real implementation. Uh, that intersection is growing. And I'd like to um, show you that perhaps more and more over the next decade, uh, those circles will not be empty, but there will be a more intersection. Um, I don't have to tell you this. Uh, this is the... Uh, not the right audience for this. This is when I uh, tell public health people about how many genetic tests are there, and uh, so we can skip over that easily. But I'd like to um, sort of revisit uh, this translation cycle, because uh, as Terry Manolio showed us earlier, um, we've arrived to the clinic, which is that green discovery to application a while back. And this is when we say the future is now. It means that the future is ready for doing studies in clinical setting, evaluating what they do, and then developing the kind of evidence for which uh, practice can be shaped, payers would pay, and then implementation science moves it around the circle into both uh, population health and prevention programs and clinical practice, which leads to in an ideal world, effectiveness and outcomes and improvement in population health. So where I live on the left-hand side, where you guys live, are mostly on the green side, trying to move around the circle. And the world of public health is trying to pull uh, the genomics world into it. Uh, although, if you look at where we are with both funding and publications, um, less than 1% still, uh, in spite of the IGNITE network and others, uh, of genomic research that's published is in that T2 and beyond space. Um, even less than that is in the T3 and beyond space. Um, so a couple of years ago, we published this paper uh, of horizon scanning beyond the bench to the bedside, showing that the action is mostly in cancer. As you can see, half of the publications uh, of T2 and beyond are in cancer. And they range the gamut from risk assessment all the way to prognosis, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And uh, we're uh, just finalizing a paper that um, focuses on the T3 component, the implementation science, perhaps inspired by this IGNITE and other NHGRI-funded work trying to move genomics into uh, the real world. Um, I don't have the data here. It's unpublished. But uh, just suffice to say that the state is still uh, very limited in terms of scope, in terms of actually uh, applying principles of implementation science. So moving beyond this uh, sort of where we are in, in, in practice and implementation science, I'd like to focus a little bit on cancer. So living in a world of public health that 
uh, as I said, has been not too friendly to uh, genomics. Um, one of the things we've try been trying to do is to show that, uh, wait a minute, there are a lot of things that are actually ready for implementation. So a couple of years ago, we devised this uh, three-tiered scheme of genomic applications in practice. Uh, the payers would love to see the stuff in the green, which is uh, uh, clinical utility and a base of evidence for which an evidence-based group, such as the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force or the EGAP or other um, evidentiary bodies can actually bless it for use in practice. Um, the stuff on the red is where most genomics is. Uh, the stuff in yellow is uh, a growing uh, component of genomic medicine for which more and more evidence of clinical validity is available but that switch from validity to utility is not there yet. A lot of pharmacogenomic traits uh, are in there, and they are still waiting for that one or more clinical trial uh, to push them over the edge. So having, trying to convince the world of public health to integrate uh, genomics into its world, uh, for the last few years, we focused on a few uh, tier one genomic applications. If you go to our website, there are many more, primarily in the field of cancer, as I said. Um, and if you think about it, newborn screening is the largest tier one program. Uh, millions of kids undergo a newborn screening every year, and we don't talk much about it, but it's the prime example of a precision public health program, if you will, screening everyone to find the few that would need extra uh, care. Uh, we focused on two genetic conditions and one heart disease condition, autosomal dominant, uh, for which uh, there are interventions that can actually save lives, uh, reduce the burden of cancer or heart disease. And a couple of million people are affected, and most of them don't know they have it. And I'm going to focus on cancer, leave FH aside for a minute. Uh, we've been collaborating with the Division of Cancer at CDC to try to um, influence public health practice in states, and each state health department has a cancer registry, a cancer prevention program. Uh, there is a one-hour public health grand round, which you can uh, see on the CDC website, that we did back in April, earlier this year, illustrating what uh, the federal government can do in collaboration with states, in collaboration with health systems, in collaboration with others, to move uh, genomics into uh, practice in the, in the field of cancer. The two genomic applications in cancer are based on evidence-based guidelines, uh, the first by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force on BRCA counseling and testing. And I don't want to read this, uh, just to, um, <clears throat> but just to illustrate that there is a D recommendation. I know that people are pushing for universal uh, BRCA uh, counseling and testing for all women, uh, but uh, the task force is not deemed to be uh, that of uh, high uh, sufficient evidence to move that into practice, but instead the focus is on a subset of women that have a strong family history of uh, suggestive of BRCA and ethnic background. Uh, this, on the same side, um, Lynch syndrome screening has been recommended by the EGAP working group, for which we have the, both the chair and the co-chair here and a few members back in 2009 which is to screen all new cases of colon cancer in, in the country, about 150,000 of which uh, to find the few thousand that have Lynch syndrome to cascade to their relatives in order to save lives earlier through colonoscopies. So uh, in collaboration with the Cancer Division at CDC, we've been funding a few states. Uh, by the last count, there are five states that are funded now. Um, and uh, what the states would do is provide provider and public education, uh, trying to move the policy and payments within the states, uh, focusing on health disparities and uh, implementation within, uh, within health systems and uh, taking care of the uh, uh, uninsured. And for which tools like no BRCA tool, which has been developed by CDC, both for providers and the general public, the state of Michigan has been uh, more or less the gold standard over the last few years because they've been doing this for the longest period of time. They've had the champions and uh, the extension beyond newborn screening programs. They've even had a genomics goal 
for the whole state, which is to increase the availability of cancer-related genetic information uh, and decrease the barriers for risk-appropriate services. So uh, uh, that's what the Michigan uh, strategic plan has had over the last few years, and they're trying to implement that. And partnerships with their healthcare providers within this, this slide is from Deb Duquette, who's the state genetics coordinator from Michigan, trying to figure out how to work with across the various state and academic partners, as well as the private sector and the, and the payers. And for that state, there has been quite a bit of success because they've been able to increase the number of referrals, counseling, uh, access, and testing over time, over the last few years. And uh, um, I don't have the data here, but it still shows disparities in utilization. Uh, black women still less likely than other women to use cancer genetic services in the state of Michigan, which tells you we need much more work to do ahead of us. Uh, Lynch syndrome is a little bit more lagging behind because of uh, the newness of it, the more complication. Um, the, uh, these are two recent papers that show that, uh, yeah, we've made the recommendations, but how to implement it in practice, ready, set, how, or room for improvement. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, a clinical public health meeting uh, to discuss how we can actually move uh, this recommendation to practice. It, in a way, it's similar to newborn screening, but, but you have to screen 150,000 colon cancer cases every year uh, to find the few that have Lynch syndrome. And uh, that has not been easy, but uh, each state has a cancer registry, and a few of them are experimenting with bi-directional reporting from the state back to the health system. And uh, last but not least, uh, Lynch syndrome screening network was formed with uh, more than 100 institutions that are part of it that does reflexive uh, Lynch syndrome screening to find uh, the three to five percent uh, of colon cancer cases that have Lynch syndrome. And uh, uh, this group has been meeting for the last few years and numbers are growing and more is to be done. I'd like to close with sort of this opportunity for moving ahead through the IOM Roundtable on Genomics and Precision Health. The co-chair of the Roundtable, Jeff Ginsburg, is here. Uh, this roundtable has been around for the last uh, 10 years. We recently changed the name. It used to be the roundtable for translating genomics into health. And now we uh, uh, jumped on the precision bandwagon like uh, a lot of people have. Uh, we've been exploring the intersection of implementation science with genomic medicine through a workshop that we did last year. The report came out this year that actually calls for a number of things to be done. The first uh, and foremost is these hybrid studies that uh, combine T2 and T3 at the same time, uh, in a way uh, exploring effectiveness within the construct of implementation, because it takes a long time to implement. I think we can learn a lot by evaluating and implementing at the same time. There are uh, case studies that could be uh, learned, uh, what we call exceptional implementators or e implementers. Uh, these exceptional Groups, of course, they have to have champions, they have to have funding. Uh, the constructs for early adopters uh, needs to be explored a bit more and in a way Ignite is uh, an example of early adopter as a network. Uh, leveraging existing health systems and networks uh, such as uh, at the state level uh, could be very useful to uh, implementation. I was very pleased to hear that Indiana is engaging the whole state as well, so this kind of uh, dialogue between uh, public and private institutions as well as uh, clinical and public health systems is really important uh, for implementation. Uh, one of the outcomes of the, the IOM uh, roundtable was a paper that David Chambers uh, and Greg Fira and I collaborated on earlier this year in, in JAMA on the convergence of implementation science, precision medicine, and the early uh, learning healthcare system. I don't have time to explore this, but in a way, I've already said the content of this because, um, you know, we've reached a point where uh, the dialogue around uh, implementation is not uh, if we should implement, but how to implement and when to implement and how do we get uh, maximum data from, on effectiveness and utility uh, uh, from the early adopters 
as well as making sure that the tier one at least applications get implemented and uh, at the same time um, uh, take care of the health disparities issues. I'd like to close with uh, sort of my own view of this. There is uh, uh, still a public health re reluctance in the space of uh, precision medicine and genomics, and I'm not going to refer to my last week's paper uh, with Sandro Galea that uh, we kind of debated each other. Sandro Galea is the uh, dean of the Boston University School of Public Health, and there is a lot of people in public health that don't think that genomics will improve population health. Uh, I happen to disagree with that, but we teamed up and uh, eventually wrote the paper. But this refers to the paper we published last year uh, with Jim Evans on uh, balancing long-term knowledge generation, like what will happen with the one million person cohort with early health benefit that will accrue from actual implementation of what we currently know. So as long as we're sequencing a million people, why not learn how to implement at least the 56 genes from the ACMG list if not more, I think maybe that list is now up to 200 or 300. Uh, and by the way, BRCA and Lynch syndrome and FH and, and others are on that list. Uh, and I think we should be able to uh, get new knowledge while we uh, learn how to implement uh, on a population-wide basis. So in closing, I'd like to share with you that uh, last year we formed a genomics and population health action collaborative of this roundtable. Uh, and um, uh, Ned Collange, one of the co-leaders of this action collaborative, uh, we're trying to develop an online uh, guide or toolkit uh, for states that are interested in integrating genomics into population health programs. So the way this works is that we work across the continuum from evidence to implementation, sort of using the case study formats, figuring out what you need to get to that tier one level then explore uh, the potential uh, population health impact if you implement them, i.e. how many lives can you save, how many diseases can you prevent, and then uh, looking at the factors that would determine readiness uh, in uh, public health systems, and then uh, using principles of implementation science, develop tools and metrics for success. And I just want to leave you with the bottom line here because I added this uh, the last minute, uh, we just recently got funding from NCI to go through this roundtable. Hopefully, we'll be working with IGNITE and uh, NHGRI in the next year to add to this uh, population health perspective additional toolkit for health systems. And I know IGNITE has its own toolkit. You've been working on it for the last few years. But it's time for public health and health systems to work together to try to uh, reap the benefits of uh, genomic medicine in the next few years. So in summary, uh, I think there is an increasing intersection between genomic medicine, implementation science, and public health. Cancer continues to be uh, the main driver for public health genomics beyond newborn screening. And the current field is still limited, and we, what we need is more robust collaboration at the interface between public health and healthcare. Thank you. <laughs>